This is a production of the Hardway HQ Podcasting Network. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Unfiltered here at HardwayHQ.com via the Hardway HQ Podcasting Network. You can find this podcast through iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, the vast gamut of podcasting applications, as well as the aforementioned HardwayHQ.com, where Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at HardwayHQ, Instagram at the HardwayHQs, if there's any other one, advertising concerns, hate mail, John at HardwayHQ.com, that's J-O-N, at, and that's right, at, use the A with the circles around it, cool gimmick, cool shtick, cool deal, baby, John, at HardwayHQ.com. I'm John Harder here in the beautiful, luxurious Hardway HQ Studios, bringing you the first unfiltered of 2022, and honestly, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a uh, very interesting time. You know, we did a lot of podcasts over the past couple weeks for Hardway HQ, and going into 2022, uh, last year on Unfiltered on January 1st, 2021, I said it was going to be the year of the sacrifice, and indeed it was. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work, and we're slowly but steadily growing this damn thing. And this year, 2022, is going to be the year of expanding even more outside of my comfort zone, doing more things that uh, are, are different and, and more things that are, to me, uh, things I normally wouldn't really talk about or try to be a little more current and to discuss things or, you know, discussing different brands and different opportunities. And I've decided to go into a little bit of discussing uh, about Disney on this first edition of Unfiltered. More importantly, I, Michael Eisner. And for me, uh, I first really learned about Michael Eisner, you know, obviously as a kid watching The Wonderful World of Disney on ABC and, and NBC, you know, as a kid, I remember having a VHS of like a Winnie the Pooh uh, compilation of different movies and stories. I think my Uncle Alan uh, used to uh, tape those and I had a copy of it and diverging went down there. <laughs> and with that, uh, I... I Michael Eisner was the face of Disney. He was the CEO, the chairman. He was the guy who ran the whole kit and caboodle. And around 2005, I remember watching I Miss in the Morning, and there was a book from James B. Stewart that just came out. It was called Disney War. It was about the reign of Michael Eisner. And as a kid, I mean, I'm not even a kid, like in college, I went and bought this book. I bought it, read it, loved it, but at the time, you know, my mind still very immature and didn't really understand the magnitude of what this book was about. I just thought, oh, it's about Disney. Uh, then a few, about, I think over the years, I would read this book uh, from time to time because I loved it so much. It's so deep and, and, and enriched in the history of Michael Eisner as CEO. And you start to realize um, the magnitude of what Michael Eisner meant from the 80s into the early 90s and then the 90s into... Uh, around 2004, 2005, when the Save Disney campaign from Roy Disney, God bless, uh, and Stanley Gold removed Michael Eisner, basically did a whole campaign to remove him from Disney, and it worked as Michael Eisner, uh, Michael Eisner actually transferred power over to Bob Iger and found a successor, which was his major knock, is that he was never looking for a successor to Disney because he thought he was the modern generation of Walt Disney. And... In the second half of the book, you really understand the paranoia, the overall power-hungry fist, and the ma massive, massive politics that Michael Eisner implored into Disney. In the second half, with the purchase of ABC and, and really doing things with ESPN. And I, I've talked about Michael Eisner uh, before when it came to uh, John Sebastian Jaguar and the ESPN bias in 2003 when it came to the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim run in the Stanley Cup against the New Jersey Devils went full seven. I've talked about that in a previous Unfiltered. I'll tag it right here uh, when it comes to old Unfiltered episodes. But the I recently got I gave the book to my girlfriend to read and she's got a million things going on. But I was like, I have it back. I kind of want to read it. And again, and you know, last night into today, I read the whole friggin' thing over 500 pages because I love uh, reading things about, you know, really re-educating my mind and really rediscovering things. And what I've learned about Michael Eisner in this book, and it's something that needs to be discussed when it comes to the world in general, and something that I think Disney personally has lacked, which is weird because Disney 
like you, you've seen South Park, how they spoof Mickey Mouse as the end all be all, the emperor of all these things created out there. Um, the lack of original creativity and taking massive risks. And Bob Iger, what Bob Iger did, obviously, was make some incredible moves. I mean, with the exception of Frozen, you know, I can't really think of any massive properties, you know, Disney has created within itself. Uh, you know, they've made the purchase of Marvel. They've made the purchase of Star Wars, Lucasfilms, and really brought those entities, those brands into the Disney fold. And it's, it's done massive gangbusters and massive numbers. But the main thing that I take away from Michael Eisner, that Bob Iger and his successor, who I don't remember off the top of my head, he just recently took the role, me and Nick Regatta were talking about it a little bit, is the fact that Michael Eisner had the ability to take risks in a way that not many people are doing nowadays. It came to creative risks, um, m like maneuver risks during his 20-year reign as chairman and CEO of Disney. And, and th the main thing I take away is, is that, is not being afraid to do anything, trying those risks. For example, you know, going right back into animation when Roy Disney told him there's still money to be made in it. Michael Eisner actually let it happen along with Jeffrey Katzenberg and Frank Wells, really letting that happen and letting all things never be looked at as something stupid and just taking those, those risks. I mean, look, theme parks alone, Yes, Euro Disney did not work out originally as planned, but thankfully, after watching Defunct Land and understanding that thing, if it wasn't for Space Mountain, the now Disneyland Paris really would have taken off and would have been a massive flop. Another great example of Michael Eisner, which I have to give respect for having the guts to even try it and try to do all those things, was the Disneyland America project, which was trying to build a historical, a historical park in, in, in Virginia, um, during where all the big wars happened, especially in the 1700s, 1800s, and trying to build your own park and base it around, very Frontierland-like, which was in the Bronx. Eisner tried to go for it, and it failed ultimately, and he gave up on it, but it was risks like that. Buying ABC to build Disney programming, risks. Uh, the countless ideas to try to, you know, to go and enhance Disney in the world of sports, like I alluded to with the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. Uh, doing risks like that. Michael Eisner had guts to take creative risks all through the board. Sing the singles and doubles thing where it doesn't matter how much money you spend on a film. If you have a certain budget and you turn a profit, it's a success. Doing that with touch tone. For everything Michael Eisner was, paranoid and a master political manipulator, Eisner was very creative. Very, very creative. And had the guts to take risks. And the answer to everything out there is the ability to take risks and expanding outside the comfort zone. And I'm never going to say I relate to Michael Eisner. Michael Eisner is way more smarter, way more sophisticated than I could ever dream of being. I mean, I'm a simple-minded man. I am a single-minded man. Mets baseball, pro wrestling, you know, that jazz. But Bob Iger did not have the creative flair that Michael Eisner had. That's a in a way, it's it's very much so a fact. He bought instead of creating, in my humble opinion. And I think in this generation, for us as a, as a country and as a people, we need to take more risks in a creative venture environment. And that's why a lot of these old-time businessmen that still exist today, the Jerry Jones, the Vince McMahon, you know, uh, it, it's... They, they still are hungry for success because, yes, they have all the money in the world, but they're not afraid to take a risk. Jerry Jones building AT&T Stadium and doing general manager moves at 80-plus. You know, Vince McMahon running, running WWE, but not being afraid to try the XFL, the World Bodybuilding Federation, Ico Pro, WWE Studios, trying to do those things. It takes risks and guts to do, and I respect that one hell of a lot. And Michael Eisner is no different from his 20 years turning Disney around from the days of Ron Miller. And no one thought Disney would ever be profitable again. And then the Renaissance period happens and, and everything like that. I have to respect Michael Eisner creatively for that. Politically, don't like that at all. I'm not a political mastermind. Corporate America, not for me. But Michael Eisner wasn't afraid to do such. And I think we all need to respect that out of him, the creative tenacity to make something happen. So uh, 
go find Disney War. It should, it's definitely out there on Amazon. Go find a Kindle version. Incredible read. James B. Stewart wrote an amazing piece. He's a phenomenal author. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, go try to find a, that book. And, and really look into the history of Michael Eisner running Disney. Political, uh, corporate politics aside. And just admire the creative risks that he took during his reign uh, as CEO of Disney from 80, 1984 to 2004. So with that said... Thumbs up to Michael Eisner for creative purposes. And risk-taking is key in life. And that's my goal for this year, to take more risks outside of the comfort zone. And Michael Eisner showed you can do that. So with that said, this is Unfiltered. I'm John Harder. HardwayHQ.com.